If you've got a Bible, uh, I'd ask you to open them up to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28. Uh, had a nightmare last night. Uh, my nightmare, I showed up and none of you did. And uh, went to open my Bible and could not find Matthew. Now, you laugh at that. It was a nightmare. I am not exaggerating. Now, I'll set it up a little bit. So each year I, I get a copy, uh, the same Bible every year, and I uh, open it up and I sign my name in there and then I put the year on there. And so it's just kind of a keeps me fresh and, and keeps me, you know, focused and, and looking for, you know, not relying on the same old notes and so on and so forth. And, and so in my dream last night, uh, uh, I, I opened this Bible, which my wife had ordered for me, and went to open to Matthew 28 and couldn't find Matthew and was blaming my wife in my dreams. <laughs> my wife ordered the wrong Bible. I mean, in the Bible, in my dream, the Apocrypha was in there. All these historical notes was in there were, were in the Bible, and Matthew was missing. And so I woke up and was mad at my wife. And uh, she... She's like, what is it? And so I told her about it. She goes, you're blaming me, even in your dreams. I'm like, I'm sorry. I just, it's, it's what happened. But uh, Matthew 28, let's uh, go there together. We're going to pick up in verse uh, number 16, okay? Scripture says this, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain, to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Every so often, every few months, we, as a church, we talk about the vision of our church, the mission, what the Lord has for us. We talk about it uh, typically every September. We do a series on it, and here we are in January. In January, we talk about it because I'm convinced of this. That many churches, and I, and I hope you understand that we don't go to church. This building is not a church. If you know Jesus Christ, you are the church. So what does God want you, what does God want us on the same team to be doing? And one of the things that I've seen in my life as a Christian, as a pastor, is that we lose sight of that. We lose sight of what God wants us to be doing because like lots of other things, we're busy, and we have our own things we want to be doing. And what happens is, is that creeps into the church, and Christ's mission for us becomes secondary to what we want. Now, each of us show up today, each of us show up to this place, are, are part of this church, and we have a certain level of expectation, certain level of, well, I expect the church to be doing this, I expect the pastor to be this, the guy that came out wearing Converse All-Stars and wearing a hat needs to be fired for not respecting some sort of dress code, right? We, we have some level of expectation of what things should and should not be, what programs the church should provide, what programs the church need for me. The church must have this. It doesn't have this. Well, I'll tell the pastor because it, you know, he'll make sure that happens for me. And what happens is, and this is important we recognize this, our desires, our expectations, our preferences supersede what Christ wants us to be doing. And that is a eminent, or that is an imminent downfall, destruction of many churches. And that's where you get into the fights in a church because no one's doing what Jesus wants them to do. They're just having business meetings about why we're not going to change the carpet, or we are going to change the carpet, or we're going to keep the pews, or we're going to go to chairs, or we're going to switch over the music, or we're going to add these lights, and why do we have a black stage and not a red stage, or a blue stage, or a pink stage, or whatever it may be, and then people just get into these scuffles, and then churches split over these stupid, stupid, stupid issues, because no one is on mission for what Jesus wants us to be doing. So... That's what we're going to talk about. We're talking about what the Lord wants us as his disciples, as his students, as his followers, as his kids, as his church to be doing. So we go back to this, 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 this important, this core passage of Scripture here in Matthew. So let's pick back up to verse 16 and begin to just dissect uh, a little bit. 
See, 11 disciples, the Bible says, went to Galilee to a mountain. We don't know which mountain it is, but Jesus had communicated to them, we're going to meet at this particular hillside, we're going to meet at this particular mountain. Some, the Bible says, when they saw him, they, they worshipped him, and some doubted. Now, we need to put that into context, otherwise you'll look and go, man, what, what a bunch of faith, faithless chumps, right? What a bunch of guys, like, what's your, what's your problem? Well, a lot has transpired. Jesus has spent roughly three years with the disciples. Three years, uh, a lot has happened. He has raised people from the dead on multiple occasions. Jesus has made blind people see, lame people walk. He has fed people. He has taught some extraordinary truths. From the moment he arrives on the scene, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they want to kill him. They, they, they took him up on this hill in Nazareth, and they, Nazareth, they wanted to push him down and kill him. Luke talks about that. I mean, so Jesus has been pursued, but Jesus is still miraculously, you know, healing and teaching and doing all these things. The disciples are along for that journey. Then after a Passover, they go to Gethsemane where they're going to spend the night, pray, rest, and Jesus is arrested. The next morning, he's put on a Roman cross outside of the city. He dies and the disciples at that point have all abandoned him. We know the story. Three days later, the Bible says Jesus miraculously, powerfully, authoritatively rose from the dead. And now the disciples have met with him. They've met with him a couple different times. But we need to kind of not put on our cynical hat, but our, our logical hat for a moment. If the disciples see Jesus risen from the dead, they're going to go to a lot of weird places. They're going to think, well, did he actually die? Did, we act, did he actually get arrested? Did, did someone that looked like him get crucified? Did he get set free? Like, this is crazy. I know Peter and John and, and Mary and the, the others are saying that he rose from the dead, but come on. I mean, Thomas even says, I'm, I'm not going to believe this whole thing unless I touch the wounds in his hands and his side. I mean, there, there's, this, there's this, this sense of wonderment about it. So Jesus shows up on this hillside in Galilee. People are worshiping him, happy to see him, but others are like, man, I just... I don't know, this is weird. This is, I don't understand. I, I, I thought I saw him get arrested. I thought I saw him die, but here he is sitting with us, teaching us. So Jesus says to him in verse 18, in the midst of this worship, in the midst of this doubt, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It's been given to me. Back in Matthew chapter 16, there's a very... Uh, misunderstood passage of scripture where Jesus is sitting around with the disciples and he says to them, what's the gossip about me? Now, he doesn't say it in those exact terms. He says, who do people say that I am? He asks them, what, what's, the, what's the hubbub? What's, the, what's the, 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 the rumor mill? What's the grapevine saying about me? And the disciples are very quick to jump on that, which is a very, to me, humorous. You know, while Jesus, I, was, I heard this the other day, someone said you're Jeremiah back from the dead. Others saying you're John the Baptist come back from the dead. Others are saying you're this prophet or you're this guy or you're that. And then Jesus turns the tables on the disciples and he says, who do you say that I am? We can talk about who people say that I am, but who, who are you convinced that I am? Are you convinced that I'm one person or the other? Are you part of this you know, the, 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 the doubting rumor mill, so to speak. And Peter speaks up, and Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He confesses Jesus as Lord, as the Son of God. Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, right, his name there. He says, blessed are you because man did not reveal this to you, but my Father who's in heaven. And then Jesus says to him this, you are Simon, and it is on this rock I will build my church. Now, people have taken that to, to believe, okay, then the church is built on Simon Peter. Like the Peter is the foundation of the church. Maybe some of you historically or maybe grew up Catholic, you, you see or saw Peter as the first pope. But here's what I want you to understand. Peter, Peter is great. I refer to my, my wife as a Simon Peter fangirl. She loves First and Second Peter, and every time I have an issue in my life, she's like, well, I was reading First Peter the other day, and I'm like, oh my gosh, she's going to hang out with Peter in heaven and not me. But anyway, so uh, she always likes this. But here, here's the deal. If Simon Peter were the foundation of the church, 
then it would crumble because the church is not going to be built on a human foundation. It's not built upon human authority. Jesus, when he says that, he says, you are Peter. And what he means by that is there's a similar word. Peter means a small pebble, a small stone, a small rock. He says, but it is on this rock that I will build my church. A Petros, Petros is what's happening there. And when Jesus says, I'm going to build my, rock, my, my church on this foundation, he's saying it's going to be built upon the confession of Jesus as Lord. The confession of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. So here's what I want you to see, and I want you to connect those dots with what's happening here in Matthew 28. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Our church, our faith, what we do has to be rooted and built fundamentally solely on Jesus' authority. And the confession, not of Peter as the Pope or Peter as some great apostle or Paul or Mary, whoever you want to add into the list, but as Jesus as the one and only Savior who came to earth, suffered for our sin, paid the penalty for our sin, died, was buried, rose from the dead, and it is through that all authority is his, right? And so we confess him as Lord, and it means that we do what he tells us to do. John says it this way, quoting Jesus in, in John 14, 15. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Very simply, if you profess to be a follower of me, then follow. If you profess to have me as your Savior and Lord, then when I tell you to do something, do it. So often we become little children and we take what Jesus tells us to do more as a suggestion. Wow, Jesus, you know, he says to do that in the Bible, but you know, I kind of have a special exemption, you know. The Lord and I have worked this one out. But Jesus says here very definitively, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So if we are his children, if we are his church, if we are his followers, he has the authority to tell us what to do. Now, for some of you in this room, he doesn't. You, you have denied his authority in your life. You, he is not your Lord. He's not your Savior. You are. And, and so today, we, as the Bible tells us, to, to calls, call you to repentance, to turn from your sin, turn from your authority in your life, turn to Jesus as the sole authority in your life, Lord of your life. That's salvation. That's the gospel. But these are folks here in Matthew 28 who are born again. They are saved. He says, so all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And I want to just read the word there, the first word in verse 19. It says, go. Go. Go, therefore. Because of my authority, I'm sending you. I'm sending you into this world. In Acts 1.8, Jesus' final conversation with the disciples he says this, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll be my witnesses. You're going to testify, you're going to talk about me, and you're going to do that in Jerusalem, a very familiar place, Judea, the region around Jerusalem, but then Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. I want you to go into all the world. But I have been convinced, because I've seen it in my own life, I've seen it in the life of our church, I've seen it in your life, that we don't like this first part. You know, missionally as a church, we talk about reach, gather, grow. Gathering as a church is awesome. I love hanging out with you for a little bit. It's great. Here we are in a warm building. We get to spend some time together singing and, 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 and the music teaching us about God's love, reminding us of God's faithfulness. Like it's, it's awesome. I love it. It's wonderful. And then John's talking to us about growth communities, right? Growth communities start this week. I can't wait to get back to mine on Wednesday night and hang out a little bit and, and teach and learn and pray together. It's a wonderful thing. But but go is the challenge to God's people to get out of your comfort zone. To do something, to go out on the limb of faith that is uncomfortable. That, that takes us away from the familiar. The older I get, the more I like the familiar. And I like my house. I like going to my fridge and I like sleeping in my bed. I know it sounds super old, but you agree with me. You're nodding right now. You're like, yeah, that's true. I like my pillow. 
I like my bed, my blankets. Like I, I like that stuff. But sometimes God says, I want you to go. I want you to go to some places where you're not going to be within the familiar. You're going to go for a long time. You're going to go for a short period. But he calls us to go. And man, do we have lots of excuses for why we don't go. The very spiritual sounding lie is this. You know, there are those people who go, and then there are those of us who send them. Wow. It sounds great. You're like, wow. The goers and the senders. Can't find it. Like, it might sound good, right? I know I sounded super spiritual when I said it, right? And I, you're like, oh, pastor, I want to be a sender, right? I just, I am, I just, I'll earn the money, I'll send the people, it'd be so wonderful, except you're never going to find that distinction in the Bible. He doesn't come to the disciples in Matthew 28 and said, listen, okay, I'm going to need 10 of you to go into business so you can fund the other two. Now, is it wrong to send people? No. But it is wrong, and it is direct disobedience to God if you're not part of the, the team, the folks who are going. Going. We have our comfort zone. We have spiritual excuses that sound good. We have fear. Jesus says, go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. It wasn't like, okay, let's go to the airport, let's get on a plane, let's fly to the, fly to the other most parts of the world. It was, um, well, let's, let's start walking. Right, there's fear, there's change, there's sacrifice. But if God's authority in our life is all authority and the chief priority is to glorify, honor, be obedient to him, then our preferences of comfort, our preferences of the familiar, our preferences for our plans and our goals and our dreams for how we want to spend our money or spend our retirement, we will gladly toss those out the door, out the window, and we'll say, okay, God, where do you want me to go? Is it down the street? Is it, is it around the corner? Is it, is it around the world? Where do you want me to go? Because here's the reality. If you belong to Jesus, he's not saying some of you can sit and send and then other super spiritual Christian all-stars can go. He's saying, no, all authority is mine, and I'm looking you in the eye here in Matthew 28, and I'm saying, go therefore, because I'm the authority in your life, it's time to get off your butt and go do something. That's, I added that, okay, just so you know. Jesus didn't say that. But that's what's happening in the Bible. He said, I'm not content with just a bunch of sitting, learning Christians, right? Sit and learn, give money to send people, but it's time to go. So many of us, the familiar, the comfort zone, our plans keep us from going. For me, over the last few months, it was something else. I'm going to tell you this story, not because I'm trying to be silly or, you know, fist pump or whatever it is in your mind. But our prison ministry has exploded. I mean, just, it's really unbelievable. I, I have lost perspective, I'll just tell you that. I sit down with friends and I'll be telling them our prison ministry and I'll tell them the numbers and different things that are going on. And they look at me like, are you kidding me? I'm like... Yeah, it is kind of crazy. Um, seven years ago, our prison ministry started with one. Today, uh, this year, this calendar year, we'll be in somewhere uh, around 60 prisons and growing astronomically. So we're, we're, we're in the Michigan prisons, praise God for that. Ohio prisons, nearly every single facility in the state of Ohio uh, will be in this year invitations to the state of Kentucky, Indiana. We're looking at Pennsylvania. I mean, it's just rapidly, rapidly growing. God's, God's blessing in extraordinary ways. But it, it was, um, it, it took us not, you know, we had to learn some things. We had to learn that it wasn't going to be always our way that God was going to open up some different avenues. So for the last six years, we've been going into Ohio prisons, and it's a very standard setup. We take motorcycles in, the band goes in, we have Rodney who does his thing. My dad speaks. We hand out books. We one-on-one -on -one evangelize with guys. It's awesome, uh, ladies, men. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. Well, quickly we're realizing 
that uh, some prisons are not going to let a full band in. Some are not going to let motorcycles in. But we don't really care about that because it's not about showing off motorcycles or some musical talent. It's about taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to people. And so one of the ways that they'll let our group in is via sports. So typically uh, softball is very uh, popular. So we'll go, we can go in and play softball, uh, basketball. A couple of weeks we have a ladies trip going in to play uh, volleyball in Dayton, Ohio. So some very exciting things, but, but it's now a different avenue. For me, I, I'm a singer, right? I le- do less and less of that in my life now and, and drive the bands crazy because I can't remember lyrics to save my life anymore. I just got old. And, and so, uh, so I, you know, I'll sing. And, and so I'm very comfortable with that because I've done it all of my life. I'm also comfortable singing with a, um, uh, you know, a mic stand in a prison because I have a weapon right in my hand at all times. So if things go south, like, you know, the band's got their guitars, the drummer's toast, he's got drumsticks, uh, but I got, a, I got a five-foot-long spear, you know, and... So you say, do you think about those things? Yes, you do. Uh, so, so anyway, so, you, you just, you, so I'm comfortable with that. Well, we're not doing the music anymore as much. And, and so it's like, well, I still want to go in. Well, how can I go in? Well, I can go in and play softball and basketball. Well, once upon a time in my life, I was somewhat athletic. Like at my best, I was mediocre, you know? And, and, and so it's like, man, well, I had an issue, and I'm not even trying to say this to be funny or silly or, or look for praise or care or anything like that, but was overweight. And so I'm like, well, I want to go to the prisons and be useful for the Lord, but I can't get my caboose up and down the basketball floor weighing what I do. And I'm like, oh, gosh. And it was like, I want to be used by God. I got to lose some weight. Now, I'm not trying to tell you, like, this is the weight program to go with. For me, it was stop eating buffalo wild wings at 10 o'clock every night. You know what I mean? But it was things like that. So, so what I did was I started very seriously going, okay, I, I want to go play basketball. Not because I'm going to be a good basketball player anymore, right? I'm 36 years old. I'm slow. But, okay, I need to at least be competitive and, 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 and put in a few minutes, you know, in the game. Well, I want to do that because I want to have the credibility to be able to share the gospel. So what do I have to do? I have to get over, I have to lay down some things in my life, get over a barrier in my life to do that. That was for me. For some of you, it's fear. It's it's fear of going somewhere, being a part of something you don't fully understand. But none of those excuses are validated here in Matthew 28. He says, what? All authority is mine. And if you're saying I'm the risen Christ, if you're saying you're my child, if you're saying you belong to me, that I'm the authority in your life, your preferences, your plans, your ideas, your agendas are lesser, less priority. I want you to go. I want you to go, therefore. I want you to go into all the world. Church, I'm very happy that here in Goodrich we're growing. I am. 2017 was an extraordinary year. For us as a church, we saw some incredible growth. Our gatherings grew uh, roughly 18% over 2016. Growth communities grew 16%. Now, I didn't figure out these numbers. The only reason I know them is because someone told me them this last week. So we, we've seen some incredible growth. It's been exciting. But if we don't have a burning passion in our heart to go into all the world to reach people with the gospel, we're a broken and on our way to dying church. That's why you look around and you see churches and you're like, what happened to that place? What happened to those people? This is one of the very first things that gets tossed out of churches because it costs a lot of money and it demands each of us getting out of our comfort zone to go. To go, therefore. At the end of the sermon, I'll share with you some opportunities to go, but I want you to see what the disciples are told to do when they go. Verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Or the way the, the King James says it, go there, go in all the world, preach the gospel. 
I take the good news. So here's what I, I see from my, my perspective of the church and, and Christians in general. There's two ditches on either side of this command. The one is the excuse ridden. Well, I'm, I'm too busy, I, I'm too old, uh, I'm, I don't have the money to do this, and, and the, the list of excuses is, is a million miles long, right? And you see that in a lot of churches. You see a lot of Christians who will just use the excuses to dodge being obedient to God's command to go in all the world and preach the gospel. But then there's this other ditch that I'm seeing more and more with a younger generation of believers. It's this bait and switch subliminal gospel presentation nonsense. And what I mean by that is, well, we're going to go and we're going to give water and hopefully they see when we give them water, they'll see in us Jesus. Like we're going to give them clothes and hopefully, you know, through some magical spell, through some Jedi mind trick, they'll know that we are Christians and they'll see Jesus. So it's this Jesus undercover stuff where we're not actually going to preach the gospel. We're just going to be nice to a bunch of people. And we should be kind to people, right? Jesus, Matthew 25, right? Feed those who are hungry, visit the sick, clothe those who need clothes, right? That, that's an important, important thing in, in our life. But here's what I'm going to tell you. When we go into this world if we overcome the excuses of going, we can't fall into the other ditch on the other side of the command, on the other side of the road, that just we go and we appease our conscience, or our consciousness, right, or, 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 or our guilt. When we go, the command is to go, therefore, because of Jesus' authority in our life, and to make disciples is to go and preach the gospel, like we could go into all the prisons we want in the world. We can go into every country in the world and dig tens of thousands of wells and, and play tons and tons of basketball and play nice music and do a few magic tricks. And that doesn't mean anything. My favorite motivational speaker, it means jack squat. Nothing. Because our command is to go into the world, right, to get over our excuses, to get out of our comfort zone, to, to just put away our agendas and say, okay, God, where are you sending me? Okay, you're sending me to Goodrich. You're sending me to Davidson or Lapeer. Or you're sending me to Grant. You're sending me to this school. All right, as I'm going, right, in that spot you're sending me, my job is not just to be a nice person, not just to do charitable work. My job is to go in and make followers of Jesus. Jesus Christ, to make disciples, to proclaim Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as the only means of salvation. This is one of the things we've learned as a church. We, we stop doing just trunk or treat to hand out candy and meet people. We just want to preach the gospel. If you want some candy, go out back and get some candy. I had an Easter egg hunt. We want people to be here. Glad you're here. Here's the gospel of Jesus Christ. You want to go out and pick up some plastic eggs with your kid and take a picture for 36 seconds. Have an awesome time. But we want people to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. We want them to know who Jesus Christ is. But it requires believers like you and I to get over our excuses, to get out of our comfort zones, and to go. And that's the very first word of the Great Commission, is go. So now you have the responsibility, if Jesus is the authority in your life, to ask him the question, God, where are you sending me? Where are you sending me? This year we have mission trips, multiple mission trips going around the world, different places. South Africa and Mexico and a few other things going on. We have opportunities to go and share the gospel. Go and make disciples. Now, in a few weeks, we'll, we'll kick off our Reach Basketball. So if you're new here, one of the things we love is we love that our, our building here can be used on Sundays like this, but then for lots of other things during the week. And one of them is uh, our basketball program. 
Not because we care if kids are athletic or, or not athletic. Okay, we, we, we don't want to play basketball, great. I, I don't care. The reason we do it is because at halftime, for every game, we share the gospel. We share the gospel with the family, friends, grandmas, grandpas, aunts, uncles, friends who have come to watch you know, their child play. Several years ago, uh, I was a coach for, uh, for our, our reach basketball. I was a coach for this. And it was one of the worst things Jesus has ever told me to do in my life. <laughs> I just said, I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll coach some kids. They assigned me the threes, fours, and five-year-olds. They don't play basketball. <laughs> they play something called basketball that's more like rugby football and duck duck goose mashed up together i mean it was like <sighs> you know what if you'll dribble the ball once we won't call traveling right i mean just and you can dribble with two hands we, we won't even count that i mean it was just it was but it was sweet spending time with these kids but man it was it was really frustrating but it was an incredible opportunity to go they said, well, you didn't really go anywhere. Yeah, yeah, I, I gave up a night of the week to do practices. And every Saturday morning, we got here early to make sure we're here to coach a game. Do you know one of the things we have a hard time getting people to do is coach reach basketball? They said, Pastor, you're laying on the guilt real thick. I'm not trying to guilt you into this. I'm trying to help you understand that the opportunity to go is not just to get on an airplane and go around the world. The opportunity to go is right here, to sacrifice a few hours a week on a night and then to get here on Saturday morning to give up your Saturday morning sleep in or whatever it may be to get here to help share some kids, to share the gospel with some children. That's an opportunity right here. few months uh, from now, which is crazy how fast it's coming, Easter is going to be here. And today, we begin our uh, rehearsals. It's crazy to think about it, but uh, uh, this afternoon, we begin our Easter play rehearsal. So some of you were a part of that last year or saw it. Uh, so we have our, our Easter play that we're in full preparation for. Uh, it's an incredible opportunity Incredible opportunity to share and present the gospel, really just put it right before people to help them see the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, I have to be honest with you. Um, I'm, I'm sick of the play. You say, what do you mean? Oh, I'm, I'm exhausted with it. I've been doing the play since like 1991. I'm tired of the play. I'm tired of the songs. I'm tired of the costumes. I, I really am. Um, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be silly or be ridiculous here, and, and maybe this will come off wrong, so I'm sorry if it does, but uh, I'm kind of the boss, so if I don't want to do something in the church, I can be like, mm, where's the youth guy? Make him do it. Okay, you go do it, buddy. You know, I can delegate the responsibility to do it, but here's what my wife and I and my, our kids are going to do. Over the next three months, we're going to give up every Sunday afternoon to go to Holly to rehearse to be a part of the play. Not because I love to play, not because I need to do more play, not because I want to be on a stage and sing, but because I want personally and I want my kids to be a part of going into the world to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people who will never get a chance to hear it. Maybe you're sitting here and you say, man, that's, that's something I, I, I want to be a part of. Yeah, you'll want to be a part of it until like mid-February and there's 18 feet of snow on the ground, and you're like, why did I sign up for the play? <laughs> but you'll go do it because you want people to hear the gospel. Some of you are sitting here saying, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not a singer, and I, you, know, you don't act fine. Uh, I can tell you this. If you're handy, you know how to build there is huge opportunity for you to help with the play. Huge. Uh, John Carter, the guy who was up here wearing the hat in the Converse All-Stars, dressed like a 12-year-old. Uh, so, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love him. He's so wonderful. I don't, 
We put that guy in charge of the money, by the way, for the church. Just think about that. So, but he's, he's wonderful. He's my dear friend. And he, he had a, he calls it a mild freak out. He had a meltdown yesterday via text. Do you ever get a text meltdown? It's real funny when someone's melting down in text because it's a text. You, you don't have to answer the phone. You can just let the text go through and you can watch them like get longer and longer and their emojis get crazier and crazier. And you're like, wow, he's freaking out. So we have our, our set team going and building things. And he texted me yesterday. He said, I've done all the calculations. We need, with our current team, we need 36 extra days to get everything ready. Now, he's exaggerating because that's how it is. It's probably more like 26, but, you know, I'll give him the 36. But the point of the conversation was the team that's in place needs more help. And you're sitting here today and you say, you know what, I got time. I'm retired. I'm handy. Put me to work. Let me help out. You know what, over the next two months, I, I can commit to, I'll give you 20 hours. I'll give you 10 hours. Here's why. Not because your, your arm is being twisted or you're being guilted into it, but because Jesus is the authority in your life and you're willing to sacrifice some things because you want to go into the world and people to hear the gospel. There's a passage of scripture that I read this week. It was in uh, the gospel of Luke. I just want to read it to you and, and we'll wrap up here. This is early on in the ministry of Jesus in Luke 5. Jesus is teaching from Simon Peter's boat. It says, And when he had finished speaking, this is Luke 5 4, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. We, we worked all night. We fished all night. Uh, we've done all this. He says, we toiled all night. We worked all night and nothing happened. And then Peter says this, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They began, uh, they came, they filled both boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. I, I did my thing. Here were my plans. Jesus said, let's, let's, let's go now. Let's go do this. They set down their excuses. They set down their agendas. And they got to experience, they were able to experience a miraculous catch. Because they were willing to do things in God's timing and God's ways. My wife pointed out something to me about this passage between our gatherings that was so great. She pointed out the fact that um, they were doing it on their own before. But then when Jesus was in the midst of them is when the miraculous happened. The miraculous. I don't know what your excuse is or your concerns. I don't know what your reasons are for not going. But guess what? I've had to learn, and I think all of us need to understand this. They don't hold up. Maybe you don't have the money to go on a foreign mission. Coaching reach basketball is free. Maybe you do have the money to go across the world on a mission trip. But that money is set aside because, um, man, I want to I retire and I want to do this. And God's call, Christ's call to us is still the same, regardless of our age, regardless of our economic status. The call is to go. To go.
I laugh about this, my wife and I do from time to time. I don't, I don't even know if I've ever publicly talked about it. But in 2003, my wife and I were graduating. I was graduating from college. My wife and I were living in Texas. We were going to move back to Michigan. And I got two job offers. The first one was my dream job. I mean, the dream job of my life to be the children's pastor at my home church where I grew up. And uh, I was so excited, you know, get to go uh, just run the children's ministry. My wife was going to be the, the preschool director, and we were, we were just so pumped about it. And I'll never forget, it. it's back in the day when we had fax machines. Uh, one of, the, you know, kids, those are, uh, I can't even explain. It's like an email, but it prints out on its own. And uh, it's this phone that's weird and makes a weird noise. But anyways, I digress. Fax machines. I remember the fax came through. My wife showed it to me, and it was, uh, it was the dream job offer for both of us. And then it was a second job offer to come and be the campus pastor at Atlas Community Baptist Church. And I remember getting the facts going, heck no, we ain't going to Atlas Community Baptist Church in Goodrich. Bunch of hicks up there. <laughs> Right? I'm serious. Didn't even consider it. Until the fall of 07, the Lord was like, you're done in children's ministry. He told both my wife and I that very clearly and sent us here. Today we, it's kind of cool. It's a very memorable moment when I think about this. Today we that's a, finished our 10th year last year here. And... Uh, never would dream about being anywhere else. Couldn't even imagine going back to children's ministry. Uh, it's crazy when you think about that. But oftentimes we have excuses, our comfort zone, all types of reasons why we can't go where God tells us to go. For some of you, it's I'm too young. I'm, I'm not smart enough. I don't know enough about the Bible. And God is saying, Go. He says, I will, he says at the end of the passage there in Matthew 28, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be, the, I'll be with you to the end of the age. Wherever I'm sending you, I'm going before you and I'm going with you. So where is the Lord sending you? What opportunity to go into all the world to preach the gospel is he laying before you? Please do not miss it. And more than that, don't be in disobedience to the Lord. If he's calling you there, go. You say, well, Pastor, that means I gotta leave our church. I gotta go somewhere else. Okay. I'm not pumped about you leaving. Well, some of you I probably would. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm not pumped about you leaving, but if God's telling you to go somewhere else, I'm not the boss here. He's the authority, right? Our church is built upon his authority. If God comes to you and says, go somewhere, go. Don't delay. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go there. Don't just do charitable good works. Go there with the bullseye of sharing the gospel. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for your work in our midst, God. I'm thankful, God, for our church that does, I believe, care for the lost, the world. But I pray that it's not just a, a burden in our heart that just kind of sits. Lord, I pray that it's a fire in our soul that motivates us to go into this world, to share the gospel. Thank you for today, Lord. Just love being together. Love being together as a church, singing and listening to your word and just a joy, Lord. So please bless in Jesus' name.